Hi, everyone. Welcome to our next session. Uh, let me welcome here our speaker, Mats, the Principal Developer Advocate at Div Riot. And we're looking forward to your presentation. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. So let me share just the screen and we'll be good to go. Okay. Awesome. Perfect. So hi, everyone. Um, I'm really, really happy to be here. And uh, I'm really happy that there is uh, so many people with, with us today. Um, so we're going to talk about um, the design systems and how to work with design system from a developer perspective. Because, um, you know, we talked about UX for years, but um, unfortunately, uh, we don't have that much resources regarding design system and user experience uh, from the developer perspective. We've got a lot of resources um, dedicated to designers and the design side of design systems and building consistent interfaces and good interfaces for our end users. But we don't talk that much about the, um, the developer side. And the fact is, um, developers are users too. Just we have other needs because we are using tools that our end users are probably not using, except if you are doing some kind of dot footing with, uh, with your own product. But um, in a sense, we are still um, the same thing as anyone. We are still users, but we need dedicated tool for uh, our very own work. So we've got plenty of designer resources, not that much dev oriented, um, dedicated to, to design system and what it is and how to work with them. Um, the idea of this guide is to try to give you some advices and some tips to start a design system from a developer side from scratch. So um, as a reminder, uh, at first came the atomic design principles and the atomic design pattern. So in a design system, you will have different um, aspects of, of, your, uh, of your, uh, your complete interface and your complex system. So the first thing is your design tokens. They are holding the different um, variables and the different uh, common sense of your brand and what it is and it describe um, your identity as a brand, as a product. Then you've got a design kit, which is uh, finally how you are exploiting these design tokens and that helps you to, to finally build the, the basic uh, elements, basic blocks of your interface and your application. Then upon that, you are building a component libraries containing the different kind of elements and the different kind of components that you, you do need to use to build your final interfaces. And you also need dynamic documentation because you know even if you've got a really good product and a really good um, design system and components libraries and tokens and so on, without a good documentation to, to come along with it, you, you, you have nothing because nobody know how to use your library and how to use your tokens and your components. So you do need a really good documentation associated to the rest of your interface. Both of them, the, the, whole, the whole stack of those four elements um, finally forms what is a design system from a developer. So design system is just here to help people to deliver better products in a, in a better way. So if I go back to the atomic design principles and atomic design pattern, when it was defined by Brad Frost, um, something like 15 years ago, something like that, I guess, um, we have this definition. We first have some kind of organic approach to what is a, a, a design process and a development process and how to, to make them consistent in the, in the overall experience, you know? So we start with atoms. They are the, the minimal viable elements in your um, interface, so in your design system and in your application. Upon those atoms, you are building molecules and those molecules are finally um, some kind of aggregating different atoms to form advanced elements. Then you could build organisms and organisms are some kind of compositions of your molecules. So you are compositing your different parts of your interfaces by building different kinds of components. 
then using those organisms and your those molecules, you can build templates and iterate, iterate those templates to build uh, final pages that you are pouring and giving to your end users. Could be pages, could be views, could be whatever you want and whatever you want to ask it, um, depending you are building a, a um, static website or a, a web application or whatever. So um, from our perspective um, at DevRiots, because we are building a product oriented to design system, we, we prefer to, to see this in this way. We've got design tokens at the center. They are the single source of truth that are finally helping designers and developers to get in sync together. And those design tokens are finally nurturing the design kit by itself and also the components library and also the documentation site. And having this um, in this shape help every kind of people in this um, front-end area that are designers and developers and product manager and QA testing and so on to all work um, in sync upon the, the, same, um, the, the same kind of elements. So uh, we want to build components and we want to build components that are first reusable. So they could be agnostic and you could use them in any part of your application and reuse them in different kind of variants depending on the context you are using them. We want them to be testable, so it will be easier to finally focus on kind of issues occurring in a specific element and fix those issues in those specific elements rather than trying to fix the entire application, you know? We need them to be customizable, so we will be able to finally have some kind of variant of theming or things like that to, to improve the final user experience with the overall interface. And we want them to be collaborative. So any kind of people could contribute both on the code side and the documentation and the design and so on. So what, I, what do we have at the design system foundations? First, the design tokens. First step, um, your design tokens are finally some kind of atoms in the atomic uh, design system pattern. And in it, we, we, we should consider them as some kind of variables. So we will externalize as much content as we can in our design system and our design tokens, and we will composite them. So we will have some kind of realm like color spacing or typography. We would group them by specific concerns like color fonts or spacing sizes and so on. And we could then name them, add some values and maybe add some, some kind of attributes to, to help to, to contribute them and to update them. Uh, from a developer perspective, it's something like a tree. And finally, if I represent them in a JSON format, I would have some kind of definition like a tokens containing colors. Those colors have some palettes of colors or some fonts. And we have some kind of um, uh, variables in them. So the base font or the gray hundred uh, color in the palette and so on with associated values and uh, kind of meta metadata like, um, like themeable or comment or whatever you want. This kind of definition is pretty interesting because this is exactly what the design token community group is pushing in the W3C as a standard to, to, to have a common standard to exchange uh, information in the form of a design token between design uh, tools and developer tools. We are um, uh, using, at DevRiot, we are using a solution named Style Dictionary, which is uh, uh, built by uh, the Amazon team. And um, we made a simple playground um, in the sense of a Style Dictionary play uh, interface where you could easily define some kind of token in, the, in this kind of JSON format and automatically export them, build them in a, in a final uh, GS file or JSON file or CSS custom properties file or whatever you want. Um, so have a look at it and, and play with it. But this solution is uh, really interesting because it directly exploits a format that is nearly um, the same one as a design token specification. So it, it's, a, it's a good try at first. Second step, build your uh, base components. So with your base components, you are, we are finally creating molecules. And those molecules um, are finally um, some kind of component-driven uh, development. So you will build all the small elements that you, you will need, the buttons, the input, the, the headers, the, the body content, uh, the menu, and so on, the navigation. So you have to stick to the basics because 
um, we don't want to build an advanced component like, I don't know, a carousel or something like this. We prefer to have really small elements that we will be easier to aggregate after that. Um, so in, in this um, very simple example, I, I just create a simple button uh, using the React Area framework. And um, using it, I just build some kind of button, adding some uh, advanced composition using the React Area primitives to, to power some kind of area content in the button by itself. And um, I just expose it. And after that, I could reuse it um, in, in the, the other side. So I could import my button and get access to my button and finally have kind of variants like a small one, a medium one, and so on. Um, then I could exploit the token in the styles of the custom element itself. So I will exploit my tokens by just importing them in any form that I want. In this one, I, I use a CSS module in the form SAS file, but I could also rely on any kind of styling library, a styled element or something like this, um, by importing the token in any formats because the D tokens are finally burned in a specific JSON format, but are exported in any kind of format that I want. And I could explode them uh, finally in the, in the final uh, component. Third step, the documentation. You do have to, to do it and to do it probably the right way to help people to understand how to use your component. I really love this approach, which is the Diatexis framework. And the, the Diatexis framework is saying that um, you are splitting your documentation in four parts. The first one is uh, the tutorials. They are just simple steps that could, you could reproduce uh, over and over and over and always having the same result at the end. This is the best way to get started with, with a, um, a new project or a new component, a new element, something like that. On the other side, you've got um, the how-to guides and the how-tos are finally an approach where you are um, solving specific issues. What will, uh, what will I do if I want to use my button in this specific context or with these specific frameworks and in these specific kinds of views and so on. So they need a, a prerequisite context that when you have it, you would have just have to follow the guide and finally have the, the expected results. On, on another side, you've got the explanations, what are um, more kind of um, some kind of FAQs, um, the historic con uh, explanation of the component by itself. So why do we develop this component this way? Uh, why do we um, embed those kind of primitives, those kind of um, React area primitives or something like this? Um, just to give some context to the developers so they are able to understand the way the system is, is working. But this is not mandatory to, to finally use the component. This is just to have a more uh, deep overview of what your component is doing and, and how you could use it in different contexts. And finally, you've got access to the reference, which is, which is the kind of a, an API documentation, um, a full overview like a, a man pages of, of your uh, final component. And you could reproduce that for any kind of components in your design system. By doing so, uh, when you split your documentation in those four paths, finally, you've got access to practical uh, aspect of your component in the tutorial and your two guides and more to the, the theoretical uh, overview in the explanation and the reference. But um, when you are just studying um, with, for the first approach, uh, how, what is this component and how it is working, you just have to focus on the left part for the tutorials and the explanation just to understand what it is. Uh, and on the other side, when you are really deeply working with the component and trying to find how it works, um, and how you have to, to use it in your specific use case, then you've got access to the right path with the O2 guys and the, the full overview documentation, full overview API um, of your component. So this is the best way, the best mental model to, to finally shape your documentation because each time you are finally adding some kind of content or looking for a new content in your documentation, you just have to think first at first, um, what I am exactly looking for. Is it some historical approach, um, a specific guide, uh, getting started uh, of another view documentation. And that's where you are looking uh, for your final documentation for your component. But because we are working on dynamic content, we do have to build a documentation that is ending um, exactly what we want because what we are shipping 
at your um, end users at the end uh, is not um, some kind of documentation. It's not some kind of design at all, it's code. So code is finally the single source of truth of your design system and of your real world application because this is what you are shipping to our end users uh, at the end. So your documentation may take care of Zeus code as a single source of truth. So rather than just reproduce some kind of content and some kind of code in your documentation and having to keep it in sync with your code. So each time you edit the code, you have to edit the documentation to reflect your changes in it. Um, you probably have to just import the code into documentation and have live documentation in it. And this is exactly what the MDX format and or the Maldon in JavaScript uh, or the JavaScript in Maldon format are, uh, as, uh, stands for. Um, they are finally just um, a way to embed your, your components directly into your documentation. In the, um, in the left uh, elements, uh, this is uh, where I'm importing the chart components and I put the chart directly into my, my Maldon content which is the best format for my documentation, or uh, in the right side, um, this is a uh, mild on JavaScript and I'm just importing uh, some kind of element and I just suffix my code block with, with a specific content. Here is a previous story. So I know that this code, which is my final component, my card, will be finally rendered as a form of the story directly into my documentation. So by doing so, you are able to code your documentation, which means that you could uh, directly embed uh, some kind of playground, some kind of props tables that are dynamically um, extracted from your code and put right in place in your documentation. Um, on your, your right side, you are you're looking to backlight, which is the, the design system editor we are building at DevRiot. And in this uh, documentation tab, you are seeing a documentation, which is a live documentation with a live playground or the live props table, and you don't have to to, to uh, write them uh, directly in the documentation. They are just extracted from the component you are documenting. For part, um, test them and test them out. So you need to test your component. You could use any kind of uh, regular framework that you want to use, but you do have to test and to unit test your components, which means testing the rendering, testing the result, testing the user's interaction to make sure that uh, anything is covered and you won't forget um, anything in any case of use e of your uh, your final component. So test them extensively. Take the default values, the properties, the different slots, and what they are uh, supposed to receive, um, and use any kind of framework that you want. You you are not uh, constrained on any kind of frameworks, but do it and do test um, your architecture. So to make a, a future-proof architecture in a sense of a design system, you have to focus on on different themes and variants for your um, for your final application. So to do so, you have different uh, kind of example, but the best way to is to defining some kind of default and extend those defaults. Um, in this example, this is um, a way of extending defaults tokens uh, in a CSS custom properties way, but you could do that in any kind of format. So in this one, I just defined different um, complex uh, elements by just defining some kind of different variants, the light one, the grape one, and so on. Then um, I will define uh, what is the default version and the default is finally just uh, a remapping of my light elements into the, the default values of my final tokens in my application. And I could define some kind of variants by just targeting some custom attributes or custom elements, and I could redefine and override my default tokens with my uh, specific content for a specific theme or a specific variant or something like this. So finally, this is just a way to define a common collection, then define the default and then override the default. And this is the best way to handle some kind of variation on some kind of, of theming of your uh, final application. Because at the end, your components will just use the, the, the regular tokens that you want, the brand, text, text first, text second, surface first, surface second, and so on. And this is your responsibility as a theme owner to finally override them depending on the context and the variants that you are specifically targeting. You could also rely on different variant queries like targeting the OS dark mode or something like that. This is exactly the same way to do so. So it's both allowed to um, have variants, but 
um, let the hand on the final user to specifically choose which kind of variant he, he, he or she prefer to use in uh, the final application. So they are just um, able to switch them by switching a, 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 theme, a theme switch or by defining their user preferences in their brother or their application or so on. Um, it finally allows you to have a live uh, version of that. If I go back in Backlight and, and, and see this kind of, um, of example in application, I have this theme switch in my documentation because my documentation is coded by the rest of my tokens extracted from my application, then my documentation is inheriting this different kind of variants and values coming directly from my design token of my application. So I could also preview live in my documentation what is occurring on my different components for zoo specific variants and so on. Then advanced composition, you are able now to build some kind of organisms and templates. So we will be able to build advanced component based on the default primitives and the default ones like building a, a big dialogue using a different kind of elements like a dialogue title um, or a, a content or a, a button that you are directly re-importing and so on. So now we could build uh, those big organisms and those big organisms are also using some kind of composition for the theme and for the aspect using the tokens, um, which means that you will be will be able to finally just build some kind of um, advanced definition like button models and so on um, that are finally a composition of your different theme of, and, and variations in that. Then you will be able to release it. And this is a final step of your design token. So distributing it as a library format and having some kind of exporting the package, building a monorepo architecture and push them everywhere in a registry where it will be able to be reused directly from your final application. So you are just distributing your, your design system as a library and you will be able to reuse it anywhere in any kind of format. Then you will be able to reiterate it and having your final component ready. So designers have um, high level tools and us as developers need the same kind of high level tools to build the design system that we want. The idea behind that is that we, you will be able to shift left to your design system. So shift left the complexity, meaning that you will solve all those, these the, the different issues that will occur in the components themselves rather than in the application itself. So that will be easier for maintaining it for the future and make it more robust um, in time. So keep in mind, I developers, I finally just use us just like you. Um, I thank you all. Uh, I'm Mads. I'm a principal developer at DevRiots. We are building uh, different tools oriented around design systems and components like Backlight you, you saw um, in, the, in the, this talk and in different demos. I thank you very much uh, for being there with me. And uh, I hope you, you know, see a bit more how to architecture uh, design systems from a developer perspective. Thank you.